Hey, it's John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and it's The Entrepreneurial You, the show for dedicated and passionate Caribbean entrepreneurs seeking daily inspiration, brought to you by author, speaker, and award-winning entrepreneur, Henneka Wakis porter You must be prepared to ignite. Coming up on this episode of the Entrepreneurial You. Always be prepared to scale and, and moderate. And then secondly, have money in the bank before you try to scale. If, if the cost is going to go up at this scale, then you need to be able to cover the cost. Otherwise, being too successful too quick is going to be a, a bad customer experience and you might actually kill the company. Hi, I'm Henneke watkis Portal, your inspirational leader and host of the Entrepreneurial You podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Jamaica Stock Exchange. And now let's go to today's episode. My guest on episode 86 of the Entrepreneurial You podcast is the founder of a private investment firm, Blue Maho Partners, and the chief money officer of Run Live. He strongly believes in giving back to his community, uplifting others and teaching people to fish, not just giving them the fish. His entrepreneurial journey began at 15 years old in Jamaica when he laid out a 15-year plan on being a positive role model for young people around the world. He has since worked in corporate America, corporate Jamaica, worked on a presidential campaign, started multiple ventures, failed at a number of them, invested in companies, raised capital from investors, and shared his lessons along the way. The long-awaited interview with David Mullings is finally, finally happening today. Welcome, David, to the Entrepreneurial You podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Henneke. Glad to be here finally. Yes, finally. We have waited long, long enough for this and it is finally happening. And I'm sure it is definitely going to be worth all our while. (laughs) I hope so. Let's get your listeners to tell us afterwards. (laughs) All right, so I normally ask my non-Jamaican guests to just tell me something about Jamaica or, you know, about the language or whatever it is that stands out for them. But, of course, you are Jamaican. So, here's my question to you. What have you gotten away with simply because you're Jamaican? Oh, that's, that's actually easy. So, back during the, the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, back in 2018, I was actually working with, some, with a team of five. We were knocking on doors. And I remember going to an area that was lower income, predominantly black, you know, literally the, the typical projects. And as they were about 4.30, the first lady I was speaking with asked me, hey, you know, what time are you leaving? I like, oh, I, I finish at about 8.30 p.m. And I no, no, it's not safe after 6.30. I think you should leave after 6.30. I said, no, don't, no problem. I'm Jamaican. And the guy beside her was like, you don't sound Jamaican. I was like, no, no, man, I'm a bad man. Don't worry, man, I have this unlock. And they started laughing and said, oh, you're good, you're good, you're safe. You know, I, I when I asked this question, I really thought, David, that I would have bowled you over with it, but apparently <laughs> you're prepared. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, all right. So we're going to be talking about the ugly truths of being an entrepreneur and how do we navigate those truths, those things that people don't really want to talk about. You know, we look on the front and it looked like a bed of rose, but behind, oh, behind yeah. the scenes, there are a lot of things going on there. Right. So we're going to get into a little of that. But your entrepreneurial journey, it started, as I read in the intro, at age 15. Tell us about that. Right. So I grew up in a very interesting household. Dad is a doctor and taught at the University of the West Indies, taught at medical school. Mom was a nurse. And I wanted to pursue medicine eventually. And so, you know, Dad and I sat down. And he said, what do I want to do? And I really said, I want to be a positive influence for young people. And we identified four ways that I think I could pull that off and try to figure out what to do in life. So I finished high school at 50, started a year earlier than most people. I was born in 81. I was born in January, so I could go to school the year before, the year after. So I finished at 15, finished with form. And I said, hey, one, I could be a politician. Dad didn't feel that like that was ideal. He felt I'd have to you know, compromise some of the ethics I was raised with to get into a position of power, to make a difference in policy, youth policy. Uh, the second option was teaching. Uh, I thought I could follow in that footstep. He was flattered, but I felt that the, the people who needed the most influence were the ones that wouldn't get into college. They dropped out of high school. So I left professional football or owning a, a media company to eventually do film and music. I felt that could impact people. And that said those two could work together. But 
I, I needed to make sure I understood business. So starting at that point, he had my brother and I, my brother was a year younger than me, uh, present a business plan every summer and every Christmas with five-year projections for something my parents could invest 10,000 US dollars in. And they said no for about you know, four and a half years until during our MBA program. Uh, when I turned what, 20, my brother and I finally made a presentation that somebody in the class offered to invest money. And mom and dad said, hey, you know, you shouldn't take money from this person. You just met them. You don't know if it's a right entrepreneur. You don't know if it's a good fit. We will give you the money instead. And we said, oh, great. I didn't know you had $10,000 you could <laughs> risk. And I said, no, no, no. That's not how it's going to work. You're going to, we're going to absorb your living cost up to $10,000. So we stopped paying them rent for their house. They took on you know, the cell phone bills, the car payment, insurance, water, health insurance. And we had to go and take part-time jobs during our MBA program. And the money we would make from the job, we would put into the business. So that's how we really got started. And, you know, mom and dad were adamant that no matter what, we should understand business. They felt that there was always going to be a path. Even if I was a doctor, I could run a private practice. It could scale. And whatever I did, business was going to be important. So mm -hmm. they were the driving force. Wow. Um, and they were very creative, too, in how they went about it. Yeah, that was that's very oh, creative. Yeah. He, I mean, that, that really wanted us to understand the value of the money. So he felt if we got $10,000 in one shot the first time we ever raised money, we would spend it differently. Mm -hmm. And if we had to work for that $10,000, we would, we would value the money more. So it worked. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that helped also to develop that mindset that is necessary to have as an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I, I think we, 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 we always hear about stories of entrepreneurs raising money, but then we don't hear about some of those stories where they spend the money unwisely. So you know, especially we, we see what's happening with the tech, you know, the tech world and Silicon Valley. Oh, this group raised $4 million. And then three years later, they're bankrupt. And we all wonder, you know, those of us who've never raised $4 million are like, what? If I had $4 million, I could do X, Y, Z. But in most cases, we had to struggle. And so we learned to struggle stretch money we learn to manage money better so it's mm -hmm. actually in my opinion it's bad to give people too much money too soon mm -hmm. I, I think that's um i mean totally different topic but as you, i hear you speak david i'm thinking about people who win the lottery <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> and oh, that's yeah, pretty know. much <laughs> oh yeah, yeah right oh, yeah. Yeah. anyway that's let's, exactly what it is exactly so let's get back on track <laughs> <laughs> all right so I've mentioned in the intro that you've gone through several ventures and you've um, started, you know, oh, yeah. multiple things and failed at them. Now, kind of give us an insight into some of the things that you've started and even this company that you started um, from out of college, you know, that you got that money. Oh, yeah. Um, to start. To... Yes, please. Anyway, so, so, so my motto is fail fast and fail forward, right? So I, I don't like waiting five years to figure out if we fail or not. <laughs> Amen. But when we, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the company my brother and I ended up presenting to mom and dad became Random Media. Uh, and the idea was that we wanted to build a platform that had the largest collection of Caribbean music videos on the web. So we came up with the idea in September 2001. Uh, went through Christmas. We were at Lime Key, actually. I'd done some, I had done a big CD. My brother and I used to DJ in college to make extra money. Mm, oh, dear. And, and uh, yeah, my cousin and, and her then boyfriend, now husband, were on the beach and said, hey, how, you, how did you get these songs? I was like, oh, I got them from, from Aquarius Records and this and that, and I'm going to build this website. And so he thought, oh, why could you put the songs on the website so DJs like me in Jamaica could download them and get access to them? So we went back and we expanded that idea and said, well, the songs is one thing, but that's when Napster was out. You don't need me. Yeah, Napster, Kaza, I'm dating myself now. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but at the same time, we felt video was more important. Why would I have to wait on... Uh, Sean Paul or Beanie Man song or Shaggy to get onto MTV in the TRL called No Deceit if I'm a Jamaican living abroad, if I could just go on the web and watch the videos. And so we built the website. We had to learn to code, do Photoshop. Uh, my then friend, no wife, Catherine, <laughs> actually did some of the graphics. She'd be in the office at three in the morning. And my brother refused to code. He did computer science in undergrad and said, hey, I don't want to code anymore. So you need to code. And mm -hmm. he edited the videos. And we had to do 56K... 120k 300k and this is youtube didn't launch until 2005 mm -hmm. so we launched february 2002 elephant man was our first interview and so that was the idea let us be a caribbean version of mtv or eventually we thought vacuum and, and we had five well, six business areas we wanted to connect to and that dad said why so random and i was like no dad we're not random that's what disney had done this is what mtv did 
But it's a nice name. We'll call the company Random Media. Mm-hmm. And the website was called Real Vibes. And that came up with the name for the website. You know, I so said, I don't know what we're going to name it. He's like, well, I don't know. But every time you guys go to a party, I just know you guys are the Real Vibes. Ah. Climbing up on top of the speakers and you're dancing up a storm. And so we named it Real Vibes. Mm-hmm. And that's where it started. We would do interviews. We ended up going on tour with Sean Paul. You know, Headline Entertainment and Carlet Dillon handled our PR force and, and got us a ton of videos. A lot of interviews. Marshall Montano sent us, you know, 24 soca music videos. So it, it was it was really fun to be in that space and in that world. Uh, we had gone to high school with some of these people. So like Papa Shot, uh, the song came out a campaign where I went to so TOK. Three of them had gone to campaign a few years ahead of me. So we got really close to TOK as well. Mm-hmm. And that's what we did. We, we ended up striking a deal with MTV. Uh, they managed the back end of the website. Um, in 2008, we actually became YouTube's first Caribbean media partner. So it allowed us to approve you as a partner for your channel as well as our channel. So you could go to, MP- to YouTube and try to get a channel approved to earn revenue, or you could come to me. Uh, YouTube, my pitch to YouTube very simply was, hey, you know, we have all this content. Uh, you don't know this, this culture or these people, so we would know who is who. You should give us the authority to approve at least our channel. Uh, YouTube said no. We applied via the website. And so I went online and found an event that was going to be in Miami that Google was at. One of the sessions was presented by YouTube. So I sat in the front row. Mm-hmm. And as soon as the event was done, I was the first guy up there shaking the guy's hand, introduced myself to him. He immediately put us on to the, the right person, Matt Villacarte. And the next day, I was negotiating a deal with YouTube on the phone. And the guy was like, man, you already know what you're doing. You understand this video on the web stuff. You understand monetization. You understand the marketing. I'm FedExing the package to you. You need to sign the contract and then FedEx it back to us. And I had the contract the next day, signed it, sent it back. And that really put us on the map. Got quite a bit of you know, press around that one. And then, interestingly enough, that was my first experience as a Jamaican meeting haters. Literally, mm-hmm. you know, there was a Jamaican in the U.S. who who emailed some of these reporters, including in Jamaica, and telling them it's not true. I, we didn't get this deal with YouTube. And I'm staring what? at that email, staring at a written contract, and they're trying to explain how this API thing would show up on our website if we actually did a deal with YouTube. And I was like, you totally misunderstand the deal that we did. But here's the quote comes from YouTube. YouTube's PR team gave a quote in the press release and, and helped issue this press release. But yeah, that was... Eye opening. I expected all the Jamaicans to be cheering for us and our culture getting out there. Yeah, don't and don't even bother talk about haters. Let's not even no, talk no. about that. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it, it comes to the territory. It's very real, right? It's oh, very. It's so um, real. I don't. I, I don't want us to um to leave the section because we're gonna take a break. A break is coming up pretty soon. But I love to get your high points because I know you've had many ventures and many experiences, right? But your high points, low points, and lessons. Sum that up for us before we take a break, David. All right. So to be honest, my high point was actually going on tour with Sean Paul and being able to bring my girlfriend, eventually my my wife. And one of the reasons I tell you a simple, quick story, but you know, Sean was at an event in Palm Beach, and I thought, you know, when you get to be this big person, you lose some of that human touch. And I remember there was a mother that came to me backstage. She was leaning over the railing. Hey, my daughter has cerebral palsy. She's sixteen. She loves Sean. Could you get him to sign this shirt for me? And so I got to Sean and his, his manager, Steve, and tell him about it. And Sean said, show me her. And he walks out there. He has the security part of the gate, goes outside. We go to the girl. He hugs the girl, kisses her, hugs the mom, takes pictures. And we all just start crying. And that wow. was, for me, was, was an eye-opening moment. That no matter how successful I get in life, I need to be the way Sean was in the way he treated that person. Him doing that for her made an, a difference in her life. He has no idea what would happen the next day and so for me that was that was the highest point like wow. seeing somebody yeah. who I looked up to do that that's something you wouldn't talk about you don't expect it so that was great mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then the, the low point oh my goodness so <laughs> the, low, the low point came from a high point we my brother and I got to be extras in the movie Too Fast Too Furious thanks to the director John Singleton mm-hmm. and because of that he let us take photos we took 220 backstage you know behind the scenes photos got posted, three of them got posted on our website, IGN.com. They pointed to Real Vibes, and we hoped that only 5% of the people would stay to look at it, watch the music videos. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, we were paying $180 a month for bandwidth, and we and, and then they pay for going over the bandwidth back then. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. we ended up 
having $10,000 over two months hit my credit card for automatic billing for hosting because we had Whoa. so many people come to the website in June and July. So the third week of August, they asked us, hey, Mr. Bunnings, you've hit your limit. What do you want to do? And my brother said, plug out the server. And he's like, well, you, you know what happened? He's like, yeah, we won't get a $10,000 bill for this month. So we shut down the website for six months because we were running out of cash that we couldn't generate enough revenue. And I remember we, we were locked up in the apartment for four days. Mom called to check on us. And, uh, and when she was saying, so what are you going to do? I was like, well, if we can't make enough money to pay off the bills, I'll just find a bridge and just jump off. That's easy, mom. And I was joking, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, my. Yeah, never tell your mom. <laughs> Especially a nurse. Mm-hmm. Don't say that to her. So she, she showed up in 45 minutes. She had pizza. She opened the curtains. She took us out. And that was really the low point. Like, we thought success would get more people to come invest and get advertising. And it didn't. It, it broke. It broke the website and put us in a, in, in a lot of debt. Oh, and what lesson have you learned from that, David? Oh, man. So, well, well two lessons. You can scale too fast. Uh, so, always be prepared to scale and, and moderate. Uh, and then secondly, have money in the bank before you try to scale. If, if the cost is going to go up as a scale, then you need to be able to cover the cost. Otherwise, being too successful too quick is going to be a, a bad customer experience and and you might actually kill the company Mm -hmm. i can relate i can so relate (laughs) oh my gosh it's an interesting story um david we are going to take a break right here but when we come back we're going to delve into what's new for you we know lots of i know lots of exciting things are happening for you right now so gonna take a break right here and come right back this review comes from fate rich out of the usa This podcast is not just for those who want to be inspired and motivated. It is a great classroom. Henneke keeps on being consistent in delivering A-class material to take us to the next level. Thank you so much, Faith Rich out of the USA, for sending, leaving this review in iTunes. And my peak performers, by all means, go right ahead and leave a rate and review in iTunes. It would help a lot. It means a lot that you're listening. Just go a little further and leave a rate and review. I appreciate you so much. So you want to start your podcast, but you don't know where to host it. Go to HennekaWatkinsWatcher.com and claim your one month free of podcast hosting on Blueberry. Or if you already have your host, but aren't getting statistics on your podcast, you can claim one month free stats from Blueberry at HennekaWatkinsWatcher.com. That's HennekaWatkinsWatcher.com. Go right now and claim your one month free statistics. We needed to raise capital. But our experience with local financial institutions was that they were cautious and slow to act, and interest rates were far too high. We had real concerns about financing our business through outside equity investors and the possibility of interference. Could we get a fair valuation for our business? We had our own ideas about the business and its value. Should I go the traditional route of bank financing? or should I try the Jamaica Stock Exchange? So we made a call and experienced transformation of our business through conversations. I'm John Mafood, CEO of Jamaican Teas, and we're listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Give us a call today at 876-967-3271 to begin your transformation through conversation. We want to see your company listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Do you have a product or service to put out to the world, but you don't know where to begin? Do you have an idea for a blog, but think that having a website is just way too expensive? Do you want to start a website, but don't know where to begin? If you answered yes to any of these questions, visit HennekaWatkinsWatcher.com and sign up to HostGator Web Hosting. For as little as $2.75 per month, you can have the perfect option for your small site or blog. You'll have user-friendly building tools and unlimited domains. Go to HennekaWatkinsWatcher.com and sign up now for your perfect website. Welcome back. And if you're just joining me, my peak performers, my conversation today is with David Mullings. Of course, he's chief money officer at Run Live, and he is the founder of a private investment firm, Blue Maho Partners. So he has been you know, exciting me with his story, how he started as an entrepreneur, um, the high points, the low points, and the lessons that he's learned. Now, we are going to move on to hear what's new for David. David, what's new for you? 
Oh man, so it's, it's been an interesting two-year journey coming off of our, our last failure where we tried to do private equity focused on the, the tech sector. Uh, didn't really work out according to plan for many reasons, good lessons learned. So I ended up working with the Clinton campaign, uh, got connected, a hedge fund reached out to me, a black-owned hedge fund. And while I was working with the hedge fund part-time, I wanted to start my own investment firm, uh, not doing as much public equities. I really wanted to focus on going, getting back into the tech world and being more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. As much as I love Warren Buffett, I'm more of a Steve Jobs kind of person. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, you know, I wanted, I created Bloom Hope Partners specifically to allow me to create one, a hedge fund that could do some, some of the deals, real estate and so on, but also allow me to do Bloom Hope Ventures as a subsidiary. That could do early stage tech companies, especially black owned and female tech companies. And so that's what we did. We, we got some initial capital. A good friend of mine, Tarek Minot, went to prep school and high school together, was one of my first investors. The minute I said, hey, here's a plan for next year, he jumped in and I got connected to Run Live and two other companies here in Florida by connecting with the New World Angels, the largest angel investor group in Florida. They've done like, you know, man, $14 million over the last three years invested in early stage deals. And uh, Sandra Arbo was the director of investor relations and said, hey, you, you have to meet this guy. His name is Mike. He's, you know, he's young in his early 30s, you know, a tech guy, but never really been an entrepreneur before, never raised money, has some pitching skills, but he needs somebody like you to help him scale and prepare us for us to be able to invest in, in his company. And I said, great, I'll meet him. He did a pitch. I liked the answers that he was giving. I still felt we could tweet, but I got it. It was gamifying running with a social aspect. I like his answer, but what differentiated him from the other apps. So I committed to help raise some money you know, from my friends and family and network. And then that, it pretty much got out of hand. I got sucked in. <laughs> <laughs> Mike said, oh, wow, we, we're getting some real commitments. This is scaling. Can you, can you step in and actually help? I know you have your venture, but can you give me some more of your time? And so he offered me a title and I said, well, I want chief money officer. I want a fun title with Blue Moho Partners is more traditional. I needed a traditional name. You know, we need an investment firm. But for the startup, I figured I could have any fun name, a fun title. And coming out of that, Mike had applied to an accelerator in Germany called LEED. And so the LEED Sports Accelerator was co-founded by the three oldest grandsons of Adidas, the founder of Adidas. And Adidas, Adidas was always one of the five companies we considered a, a potential exit to. So he said, hey, we, we have to do the Skype interview. Can you be on the call? So I did the interview and I said, hey, it went well. We want to do another screening interview in two weeks. David has to be on the call. Okay. And I get in sucked in now from investor to now helping to present. So we went in, we did a second presentation and then they reached out to us in, in mid-July. Well, early July and said, hey, you've been selected as one of the 30 out of over 400 to come to our selection days in Berlin and present in person a 90-second pitch and then 13 25-minute interviews. <laughs> and I was like, okay, oh, and David, right. And I said, oh, and David has to come. So we, we got to, we had to interview with mentors, coaches, uh, potential investors. And so we went. And then they call us within two days of coming back from Germany and said, hey, you know, you guys got in. We'll announce it next week. You're one of only seven. They didn't even pick 10. They only picked seven startups. And we're the only U.S. startup to get in. And we're the, the only Jamaican seven I've gotten in. So it's 100,000 euros to be invested in the company for 8%. So it's a 1.25 million euro post-money valuation. We do a 12-week program, September 10th to end of November. We will get to live in Germany for 12 weeks, which is crazy. I never expected this at all. At the end of the program, we present the 16 investors who are affiliated with the program, as well as their internal 50 million euro fund. So uh, that was exciting. And that's, that's half of my life. Uh, the other half is Blue Moho itself had two joint ventures, which would have launched by the time you hear this. But we have a real estate fund coming out that allows Caribbean investors to invest here in the U.S. in some in triple net leases, some interesting projects. I can't name the partners yet. And then we have a second fund with a separate joint venture, another group in Jamaica that allows US-based Jamaicans to invest into Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. So we're doing it both ways. Allow Caribbean to get into deals here in the US and then allow US, mainly Jamaicans in the US who want to invest back into Jamaica through a, a regulated vehicle to be able to do that. So that's 
that's where it's going to be. Hopefully, uh, we're going to do some other early stage startups. Uh, I didn't intend to only do Run Live, but now I've gotten sucked in and I've been made a co-founder. And, and it's been enjoyable. It's the first startup that I've been a part of where people testing it and using it is actually good for them. It's healthy for them to actually go out and run. All right. So I want to see, I want you to tell us more about the app. But before you do, well, tell us about it, really. But before you, you do that, um, LEAD is an acronym for what? So is it actually it? Stands, for, it stands for Legacy, L-E, of Adidas Law. That's the founder okay. of Adidas. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, great. All right. So and their goal, what, what pretty much their goal? So, so they want to find sports startups in the tech space that can change the way we play sports or learn sports or interact with other people doing sports. So that's all in, in a tech incubator, a tech accelerator for sports-related tech startups from around the world. And this is the second year that they're operating. This is their second cohort. Awesome. And um, Run Live is in that second cohort, which is fabulous. I mean, I feel so proud of you guys. As a Jamaican, and you're a part of this. So, yes, I'm excited for that as well. Um, in terms of the app itself, just give us a little overview of what the app does, how it functions, what, and if there's any other app like it, and how it, um, what's the USB for that? So the idea for the app came from Mike Thompson two years ago, really good started on the programming and Mike is Jamaican and born in Jamaica lives in Miami and basically he and his running partner he had one friend he would run with a friend moved to Texas and they couldn't run at the same time he wanted to be able to run with his friend banter and chat sometimes and so when he used an app like Nike Run or Mac My Run those don't allow it to actually run against somebody live or run with them it just tracks your run and I could see what my friend did go on the mine and we could do some messages back and forth and so Mike wanted to create a live running experience where he could look for somebody running, say, a 3K today, right now, anywhere in the world. He would find other runners and, and pair them up or send them off. And then, obviously, we our generation loves games. I grew up with Nintendo. I still play Nintendo and Xbox. And the idea you want was to gamify. Let's add, you know, some games on top of it. So if you look at a Pokemon Go or Fortnite, the way people are playing all these games, uh, let's add gamification. So when you run, you actually earn what are called run coins. You earn coins for burning calories, for completing uh, certain tasks that we're going to be setting in there. And then you can use those coins for discounts or even free stuff in the store. We have a store with brand partners. You'll be able to get discounts on shoes, for example, or gear. And that's the idea behind it. It's, it's a social live running app. As of now, nobody else has the live running part. They do have the social parts where you can interact with each other, Strava being the most social one, and it, that's not just for running. And so uh, the live experience is unique to us. It is patent pending, and we, we like that approach to, to being able to race against somebody. It actually says, hey, David, Henneke is 10 meters ahead of you. Speed up. <laughs> wow. Uh, for, so those of us, right, <laughs> for those of us who are competitive, uh, that's an extra boost right there. Yeah, yeah. So you are taking health and wellness to a whole other level, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, and, my yeah. gosh. And, it is and, exciting and, and stuff. It is exciting. One of the things that really got me interested was, I remember October last year, uh, I, I was up at 4 in the morning, 4.30. My wife woke up and she's like, why are you why are you still up? I know, why are you up so early? I was like, no, no, I've been up since 1 o'clock. And she's like, why? I was like, I have 13 pages of notes on my iPad for Run Live. I was like, I haven't, she's like, I haven't seen it. It's exercise about a startup since Real Vibes days. All I know, she was pregnant at the time during January with our third child, our daughter, our first daughter. I said, all I know is that when you, when I give birth to this baby, you need to buy me an Apple Watch so I can sign up for Run Live and find other women who are running who want to lose their baby weight. And and I, I never thought about that. I was like, wow, if the, if the graphic design artist person can figure this out quickly and see a use case, we are onto something. And so I think, you know, some of us don't want to. I don't want to run against a marathon training person, I'll be honest. It's like, you know, I played football in Jamaica in the, you know, for Real Mona in under 20 and a few games in, in Division 2. Most people don't want to play with me. I'm going to be at a level above them. The same thing with running. So if this allows you to find somebody more at your level, you can run with them. Or somebody doing the same thing as you. I want to lose baby weight. You're going to be less judgmental. Or if the person is 55, they want to run with people in their age group. They don't want to run against a 30-year-old. I never thought about that kind of thing. So we're looking forward to introducing those specific pieces in there as well into the app. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is just great. Um, David, 
we have come pretty much to the end of our conversation, albeit a very interesting one. And it was indeed worth the wait, I must tell you. <laughs> All right. So um, the you, I know that prior to us coming on live, you did mention that you have a giveaway uh, for our community. So I want you to share that as well as share how might our community members get in touch with you. Great. So the website is davidmullings.com. My phone number is on there and I'm hiding from anybody as well as my, you can fill out the form. to It goes straight to my personal email address uh, so I can reach out to you as well. And the uh, giveaway will be on the website. It'll be at davidmullings.com slash books. I had done a book a few years ago called Things Entrepreneurs Say. I'm doing a second version now, but the PDF will be available for you to download free of charge. And the idea was that I had all these other books for inspirational life quotes. But I couldn't find any read quotes for entrepreneurs. I wanted to read a book you know, about entrepreneur quotes, whether it's leadership or failure. And so I decided to put one together. And so I pulled some quotes, famous quotes, and then I actually reached out to about 110 entrepreneurs and put them in there. It's like a pocket-sized book, and it's been really helpful for me to just be inspired each day. You know, just read a quote and, and get some inspiration. So davidmullings.com slash books, and you'll be able to click the link and download a free PDF. Amazing. I've had a great time talking with you, David. I've been talking with David Mullings, my peak performers. I'm sure you um, you may have missed the name, but it's David Mullings. And we're talking about his entrepreneurial journey and, you know, his new uh, startup, Run Live, you know, has, has been ac uh, accepted into the Lead Accelerator program in Germany. So that congrats again. And I wish you all the best, you and your partners. And I look forward to hear and to see what you will do next. Thank you so much for having me, Henneke. It was a pleasure. So my peak performance, as you know, it does take hours of work to produce one 30 minute episode of the Entrepreneurial You podcast. And I really love it. I enjoy it immensely. But you've been listening for a while and you've been thinking to yourself, if only there was a way to make a contribution to this amazing work. Well, now there is. For as little as $2 per month, you can be a part of this movement. You can contribute because you're already a part. You can contribute to this movement. It will really go far away. As we say in Jamaica, every mickle make a muckle. So simply go to patreon.com forward slash T-E-Y to find out how. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash T-E-Y to learn how you can make a contribution directly to this movement. And of course, there are several perks right there awaiting you. So go right ahead and sign up, make a commitment to this great movement. Now, if you're looking for some great resources, some excellent resources to peak your performance, visit the resources page on hennikawatkisporter.com to gain access. Of course, all the products and services that are listed are ones that I actually use and I can recommend. They have been helping me immensely in my quest to level up and I know that they will help you too. We have come to the end of another great episode of the Entrepreneur You podcast. Remember to subscribe in Apple Podcast and download all the episodes that you would have missed if you have not already subscribed and downloaded the episodes and play them to the end as well because good stuff is always at the end too. So do that as well as go and leave a rate and review right now. Oh, I'd appreciate that. It helps a lot because I put a lot of effort into creating this free content and it does help when I know that it is of significant value to you. So show your love by going to Apple Podcasts and just leave a rate and review. And when you leave that review, do send me an email at hennikawatkisporto at gmail.com because I'd love to be able to read them in an upcoming episode. And if I'm not notified, I won't know it's there because unless you go into all the different stores in Apple, there is no way that I can actually know that a review was left or a current review was left. So it's important that when you leave your review, you send me an email, let me know about it so I can go look for it and read it live on an episode of the Entrepreneur You podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Henneke Watkins Porto. Remember, you were born to win, but to be a winner, you must plan to win, prepare to win, and expect to win. What good?